Alf Landon, known as the grand old man of the Republican Party, turns 100 years old in a few days. The 1936 GOP presidential nominee made a rare excursion from his home in Topeka today, said he needs the exercise to be fit for a scheduled meeting with President Reagan on September 6th. An acquaintance in town saw him and said, glad to see you up and around. Said Landon, so am I. David Jackson, CBS News. One day, one day, when the truth comes out, monuments will be built in his honor all over the world. His name will be a shining light, an inspiration for generations and generations of people. His songs will be anthems. Ten and a half minutes after the hour of 8 o'clock, Friday night, August 28th, 1987. Lasseter with you until 11. As I am every Friday night, August 28th, 1987. We all knew it would come to this one day, and this is the day. I don't know why it is, but for some strange reason in my illustrious broadcast career, August and or September have been major turning points. Seventeen years ago tomorrow, literally, seventeen years ago tomorrow, I got my first job in radio. I didn't start until September the 1st, but I got the job on what was then Friday, August 29th, 1970. It was a memorable occasion in my life. I was sitting half... <clears throat> well, snickered. In a sidewalk cafe in St. Thomas and the Virgin Islands, broke, hungry, and unemployed. And a young man asked if he could sit down and share my table, and I said, boy, of course you can. Thought perhaps he would buy me a drink for intruding on my space. He didn't. However, he gave me a tip that has sent me on a 17-year odyssey. He said, my goodness, you sound like you should... Well, excuse me, he said, my goodness, you sound like you should be in radio. I said, oh, really? With my hand cupped over my ear. He said, I work at the FM station up on Bluebeard's Castle. They're looking for a morning person. I said, oh, really? Which way to the station? I went up to the station and I met the general manager. His name was Len Stein. I lied through my teeth. And I got the job. Not because I lied so well, but because nobody else had applied. It started at 7 o'clock in the morning... And it didn't pay a hell of a lot of money. And in the Virgin Islands, people don't like to get up at that hour. So I became a radio star. There was nothing terribly memorable about this station, WESP-FM. It was located in a converted room at Bluebeard's Castle Hotel. There was a receptionist, a morning man, an afternoon man... One salesman and the general manager. The receptionist had but one job to do. It was to fill out the daily program log. The station had two clients. Each ran one spot a day. I'm not kidding. I am not exaggerating. The receptionist, even though she was a little slow, would finish her work by about 9.20 in the morning. She then put her head down on the desk and slept for the rest of the day. The phone never rang. She was never disturbed. Oh, I beg my, I beg your pardon. Her mother would call at about five minutes to twelve to wake her up to go to lunch. And I, again, I am not kidding. <sighs> this is the way it all started. Perhaps the most memorable event of my tenure at WESPFM is that I was sitting in the studio one day. And you must remember I had never been inside of a radio station before in my life until I went to work here. And no one had bothered to explain anything to me because I said, Hey, you know, I'm familiar with all of this stuff. Uh, no need to help me out on this. I'm sitting there doing a newscast. And all of a sudden, from behind me was the most god-awful noise I had ever heard. It was something like a foghorn going off three inches away from your ear. Oh! And it went on and on and on. The only thing I could do was to say, What the hell was that? I was terrified. Absolutely terrified. And it went on and on and on. I didn't have the good sense to turn the microphone off. 
The only thing I could do was to get up and leave the station, go out to the front desk at the hotel, and call the general manager and told him that there was this ungodly noise. <laughs> it's true, I swear it is. He said to me, why, well, that is the EBS monitor, the emergency broadcast system monitor. And it was being used in a test mode. And he told me how to shut it off, so I went back to the station. I shut it off and continued the newscast. Ah, things got better. I left WESP and I moved to Norfolk, Virginia. And went to work for WOWI FM, Wowie. I did the morning show. I was the program director. Perhaps the greatest highlight from that job was that I came up with a brilliant idea. I didn't earn very much money. I got a hundred bucks a week. And this was, a, I suppose, 1971. But even in 1971, a hundred dollars a week was not a great deal of money. I'd heard about trading in radio. That is where you trade advertising time for goods or services. And so I suggested to the owners that since they paid me so little, perhaps they would allow me to trade. They said no. And I said, well, how about if I, and I explained to them a little scheme that I had. And they said, we don't care. Go ahead. Do it. So I came in the next morning with a half-used bottle of aftershave lotion. And I offered to trade it with my listeners for whatever. Asked them to call me up and tell me what they had. If I liked what they said that they had to trade, I'd say, I'd say well, come on, bring it in. And I would trade up and trade up and trade up and trade up until I finally furnished my entire apartment, starting out with a half a bottle of aftershave lotion, Old Spice, as memory serves me. Nothing much interesting happened to WOWI except for that. It was then off to Utica, New York, to WOURFM. 17 months. 17 traumatic months. Now, WOUR was the biggest pig in the broadcast industry. You cannot begin to imagine anything worse. I was the general manager. The day I arrived, the staff was in the midst of a strike because they hadn't been paid for three weeks. They had been told that I was a big radio star from WPLJ FM in New York, which was a total lie. I mean, a complete, total fabrication. I had never even heard WPLJ, let alone work there. But it gave the staff of hippies some confidence, and they came back to work. It was an FM progressive rock station. The people that owned it were slowly going bankrupt. It wasn't that they didn't like the employees. It wasn't that they were mean. They just didn't have the money to pay them. I decided that these people had to be paid. I had a checking account in Norfolk, Virginia. I had a checking account in Utica, New York. So I would have the people who owned the radio station issue their paychecks. I would then take the paychecks from the employees, write them a check on my Utica, New York account, deposit their payroll checks in my Norfolk, Virginia account, write a check from my Norfolk, Virginia account to cover the checks I had written to the employees in my Utica, New York account, and just keep going round and round and round and round. And we did this for a number of pay periods. Well, finally, the bookkeeping got so complex and the amount of money became so large that I decided we had to come up with something else. And I certainly do hope there's a statute of limitations on what I'm about to tell you because if there isn't, I'm in major trouble. I laid everybody off. Put them all on New York State unemployment compensation and had them come back in and volunteer their services to the station so at least they get paid every week and the station could still stay on the air. I didn't like WOUR in Utica, New York. I hated it. The weather was awful. The facilities were awful. And I had been told by my employer that I would only have to be there for three months. Almost seven months after I arrived, when I was still there, I picked up the telephone and I called my employer back in Norfolk. And I said, you promised! You promised! He'd say, well, you know, just give me a, a little more time. Uh, we'll, we'll get you out of there pretty soon. And 
there was a terrible, terrible noise outside the station. The station wasn't air-conditioned. It was on the third floor of a building on Genesee Street, the main street in Utica. And the noise was so bad that I could not hear what my employer was saying. And I'm screaming into the phone, Wait, I can't hear you. I can't. There's some kind of terrible... Wait, wait a second. Hold on, hold on. And I laid the phone down and I walked over to the window. Now, Utica, New York, has some of the worst winters a person can begin to imagine. And the summers ain't no treat either. They are very hot and muggy. Not very long, but very hot and very muggy. But that particular day, for whatever reason, I do not know. I will never know. They decided to move all of the snow plows from one location to another. And they were all rumbling down Genesee Street, clanging and banging with all of their, their chains on, making such a ruckus that you can't believe. I looked out the window. I hated Utica. I knew that the winter was coming. And there they were, a, a procession of snow plows that stretched further than the eye could see. I mean, we're talking about maybe four or five blocks worth of snow plows. And it got worse from there. Nighttime in the city of Tampa Bay. Unlike night anywhere else. And no other radio station lights up the night like News Talk 57. WPLB. We are the talk of Tampa Bay. 22 minutes after the hour of 8 o'clock. I, I will spare you the rest of the grief and agony in Utica. And we will move back once more to WOWI in Norfolk where I went to work for a second time. Only this time the station had been sold, and it was now owned by a black fundamentalist bishop who used to hold prayer meetings from, with members of his congregation in the front room of the station praying for improved sales every morning. I was a consultant to the bishop. He had never been in the broadcasting business, and how or why I got the job, I will never know. And everything was going along fine, except the bishop wasn't paying me. And so I sued him. And we went into court, and the bishop contended that the reason he wasn't paying me is because I never did any work for him. That I was a professional actor. And that I was never at the station. Well, the bishop wasn't a very intelligent man. You see, a number of the people that he hired to be on the air did not have licenses. You still had to have a third-class FCC license back then. And so I, having one, used to sign the logs. Now, granted, again, I certainly do hope the statute of limitations has long gone on this. Most of the time that I would sign the logs, I wasn't there. I mean, I couldn't be there 23 hours a day. But nonetheless, I was on the log all that time. So the bishop was in a very, very bad position. He could either admit that I signed the logs with his knowledge, fictitiously, or... He could fight it. He fought it. We subpoenaed everything. It took several men and a couple of carloads to bring in all of the documents into the court. And the bishop had this attorney, and I don't mean this in a derogatory sense, but the attorney bore a very strong resemblance to the attorney in Amos and Andy. Very flamboyant, a little man, and he's going on and on and on at great length. Well, I was doing some community theater at the time. Which is why the bishop came up with this brilliant idea about he's a professional actor and he's never here. And the attorney is saying, and your honor, this man, he's, a, he's on a stage all the time. He's never at the radio station. And the judge said, is that true? And I said, no, it's not true. And he said, well, why would they say this? I said, I don't know whether... I, I'm, I did a play at the Norfolk Little Theater. And he said, you did? Which one? And I said, well, I did Hamlet. And he said, Hamlet, I saw that. That was a very good production. What, which part did you play? And I told him, Voltamond. <clears throat> no one ever puts Voltamond in Hamlet, but that's another story. And so the judge and I sat there and talked for the next five or ten minutes about the merits of the Norfolk Little Theater. What a great play Hamlet was. Found in my favor and dismissed the case. From there, I found myself in Richmond, Virginia. I had decided to get out of the radio business, and I was going to become a great photographer. 
and so I retired and went to school in Richmond. Both my desire and my funds ran out, and I had to go back to work, and the only job I could get was as an announcer at a beautiful music, at an automated beautiful music station in Richmond, Virginia. I was earning $250 a week. This is now the mid-1970s. Nothing much happened there, except one day, I was at the station in Richmond for $250 a week, WEZS-FM. And the next day, I was working in Pittsburgh, WJOI, owned by the same company at $31,000 or almost $32,000 a year, owned by the same company. Station in Pittsburgh was Union, the station in Richmond wasn't. They changed formats eventually, and I had to buy out my contract. That was a delight. The most money I've ever had in my hands at any one time. And I came to Florida. Again, I retired to trade commodity futures. That's a long, unpleasant story. I won't trouble either of us with it. But it didn't work out. And again, I had to go back to work. Well, the only job I could get was a WKQS in Miami. Another semi-automated, beautiful music station. I sold my house, my wife quit her job, and we moved from Naples, Florida to Miami. Eight days after I started the job, the station changed formats. From beautiful music, where you sat there, and once every 15 minutes opened the microphone and said, you're listening to beautiful music on WKQS-FM. From that to country, in one fell swoop. Two days' notice. I became Bobby Clifford. I was earning $250 a week again, a figure I seem to have gotten stuck at for quite some time. The rating book came out, and I had an 8.4 rating, an 8.4 share, which in Miami was phenomenal. It made me number two in the market. $250 a week. The other people who had ratings like that in Miami were earning close to $200,000 a year. But I got 250 bucks a week. So I went to the owner and I said, Hey, this isn't right. I want to raise. He said, How much do you want? I said, Well, at least give me 300 He said, No, nah, I can't afford it. I said, Okay. I went back into the studio. I opened the mic. And I announced that I was leaving for the day. I turned off the transmitter, shut out the lights, and headed for the parking lot. I got my hand on the car door when the owner came running out of the station and said, All right, all right, 300 a week, 300 a week. We pulled the stunt on him two more times before I left that station. But it turned out okay. I eventually got up to a whopping $375 a week, still pulling eights in Miami. But at least I was doing most weeks in the neighborhood of $700 to $1,000 in public appearances. Not so bad. But that all came to an end. And one morning I was sitting there. Well, I wasn't sitting there. I was laying there. And my phone rang. And I got into talk radio. WGBS called me. I was hired by a secretary over the phone. I had never applied. I'd never talked with anyone there. Someone just recommended me. And so the program director had a secretary and call me and hire me for the weekends. Ah, that was a disaster. Nobody listened to WGBS. It was an awful station. It was one of these stations where everybody was your friend. The jingles were awful. The format was awful. They had... Just a handful of lines coming into the station. No one ever called. No one ever called because no one ever listened. And I was doing late Saturday and Sunday nights. But lo and behold, the man who I idolized most in the business used to listen to my show. And he took a liking to me. For whatever reason, I do not know. And he hassled the people at his station to hire me away from WGBS and bring me to WINZ. 
I don't quite know how it happened. But from WINZ, I finally ended up at WPLP in Tampa. I'm able to see an awful lot of humor in much of what happened at ESP and WOWI and EZS and JOI and KQS. And Someday, I suspect I'll see a great deal of humor in what happened at PLP. Hi, everybody. Larry King in Washington. Sure hope you can join me tonight for the Larry King Show. Our special guest and extraordinary gentleman, the owner of the Miami Dolphins, Joe Robbie. All Mr. Robbie did was go out and build himself a privately financed football stadium that bears his name. Meet Joe Robbie tonight with your phone calls on the Larry King Show on this mutual radio station. I agree with everything you say. Bob. Eight thirty four of the time. So here I sit like seventeen years later in a talk radio station doing what it whatever it is that I do for a living, and I will admit to you. I earn my living doing something that I do not understand. I do not understand talk radio. I don't know why anybody listens to it. I don't know why anybody advertises on it. And I don't know why anybody would devote his life to working in it. I do not understand talk radio. It doesn't make any sense to me. The thought of sitting home listening to somebody talk on the radio is a little peculiar. But the thought of sitting home listening to somebody talk on the radio taking phone calls from strange people is even more peculiar. Now, what's even more peculiar than that is I also enjoy listening to talk radio. And I don't know why, but I've been hooked on it for 20 years. Now, most of the time, nothing of any real importance ever goes on on talk radio. Maybe 10% of the year, maybe 10% of the year, there are interesting things in the news and there's a good discussion. But the other 90% of the time, it's basically chit-chat, nonsense, etc., etc. And yet it's still the most fascinating format I can imagine. It's fun. It's alive. It's vibrant. But talk radio tends to take itself much, much, much too seriously. The audience takes it too seriously. The people who run the silly things really take it too seriously. I mean, you wouldn't believe they actually think they're accomplishing something. They actually think they're providing, you know, some kind of a, an important service in the community. And sometimes even I take it too seriously. But talk radio has, well, both its good points and its bad points. Perhaps the biggest shortcoming in talk radio is that too many people in the business, management and hosts, are afraid to offend. They don't want to offend anyone. So we have this synthetic politeness all over the dial. Why? Beats me. We are not polite otherwise. Oh, go on, tell me that you drive down the street and you don't flip somebody the bird. Tell me that you're in the supermarket and when somebody's blocking the aisle, you don't mutter unpleasant things under your breath. Like, I ought to go die off. We're not polite people. But for some strange reason... Hosts and management and even a lot of the people in the audience want this synthetic politeness when you turn on the radio. Now, I don't know how you can say anything and always be polite. Oh, sure, you can mouth words all the time and be polite. But how can you ever say anything and not offend someone? How can you ever put across an idea or an opinion without offending someone? The problem with talk radio is that it's not real enough. There are there are topics that are taboo. There is language that is taboo. There's pressure from the audience. Well, yeah, from the audience. We're talking about three old ladies and some born-again Boy Scout who are always writing letters to the general manager and scaring the hell out of the poor man. There's pressure from sponsors. Sponsors who ignore the ratings but want to buy somebody that makes them feel good. Huh. What are you going to do? Do you know I once watched a videotape of something called a focus group. And in that focus group, 
There were 10 or 11 people sitting around a table and a group leader. And the group leader asked the people who were all talk radio listeners, what don't you want to hear on talk radio? And what I'm about to tell you is the gospel truth. One person said, uh, religion. And everybody went, oh, oh, God, yeah, oh, no, no, no religion. Another person said, sex. Everyone around the table said, oh, oh, God, no sex, never sex. And there was some silence. And so the group leader said, anything else? There was some scratching of the heads. And somebody said, politics. And every around, everyone around the table said, oh, no, no politics. These people literally said they did not want to hear any talk about religion, politics, or sex. Now, the man who was sitting in the room as I was watching this is the one who commissioned this study and paid something in the neighborhood of $12,000 for it. And he turned around to the people in the room and said, You see? I couldn't believe my eyes. Because the focus group went on and on and on. And they talked about people doing talk radio. And they talked about how much they enjoyed this one because he talked about politics. How much he enjoyed the other one because he talked about religion. How much he enjoyed still someone else because they talked about sex. But this man who ran a talk radio station, thank God no longer does, actually believed that these people were telling the group leader in this focus group the truth. Of course they weren't telling him the truth. People would never admit to what they want to hear. But that's what we talk about. Religion, politics, and sex. Maybe some sports occasionally. Some of us. And this general manager stood there with a straight face and didn't realize that he was being snookered. Didn't realize that he had squandered $12,000 of somebody else's money in this focus group. This show has been a success. Why? Good question. I would like to think because it is the closest thing to real life. Both the host and the callers. We're not afraid to offend anyone on this program. We never have been. And we do offend people. We offend people because we say what we think. We don't say what people want to hear. We don't play devil's advocate. We say the truth. What is on our minds. And yet when I think back to some of the shows that stick out in my memory in the roughly two years that I've been here, on the surface, some of those shows would seem to be anything but real. There are three that come to mind. One that we refer to as Fluffy the Cat. Another one, Bob the Automated Talk Show host. And the third, the $50,000 giveaway. Now, the premise behind Fluffy the Cat was that the host, Mr. Lasseter, was very distraught that he wasn't getting enough calls. And so he had brought into the studio a young kitten and a bucket of water. And he threatened to dunk the kitten into the water if the board did not light up with calls. It immediately did. But Mr. Lasseter was not about to ruin a good piece of shtick. He pretended to dunk the kitten along with sound effects into the water and then started taking some calls. Well, most people were highly amused and quite understood that we were not dunking a cat into a bucket of water. But about a quarter of the callers didn't. And not only did it generate some great calls that afternoon, but it also generated numerous letters to the station from people who were enraged. Enraged! That someone would dunk a cat into a bucket of water to get calls. That's real life. Because at least a quarter of the people out there ain't playing with a full deck. And we clearly demonstrated it. The other show that I mentioned was Bob, the automated talk show host. Now, what we did for that was to record a whole bunch of bits. And we heavily edited and heavily uh, doctored up with electronic gizmos the tape so that they would all sound different. So that it would sound like some type of an automation system. Announced at the beginning of the show that management had gone berserk. 
and that they had bought this automation machine from some slinky, sleazy salesman, and that there would no longer be any need for a real live talk show host, that everything could be taken care of with just a few tapes. Again, this time about a third of the people believed it. Generated some great calls. I don't remember if any letters came in on that one, but people believed it. Utterly absurd, crazy, ridiculous. But they believed it. The third show, the $50,000 giveaway, was done last January the 1st. We offered to give $50,000 to each and every person that called. $10,000 to each and every person that listened, not just that night, but every night during the course of the year. It would have taken billions of dollars to do such a thing. That night, about half of the people who called believed it. In essence, what we did was to hold a mirror up to the community and show them just how gullible they were, just how much they didn't stop to think about what it is that they were hearing. There were other shows along the way, too. Shows that really stick out in my mind. There was the first show with Rabbi Bresky. There was the second show with a man named Henry Hurt, who wrote a book about the JFK assassination. And there were two other shows. The one with Randy Macho Man Savage, the wrestler, and one with Gordon Soley, the wrestling commentator. Shows that really stick out with me, shows that I really enjoyed. Rabbi Bresky, it was three hours of heated conversation about religion between an agnostic and a man of the cloth. No holds barred. There was screaming, there was shouting, there was pounding on the console by both parties. Randy Macho Man Savage is an outrageous character. A wrestler. One with a sense of humor who sat on these airwaves for an hour taking calls from all different kinds of people, all different walks of life, the same situation with Gordon Soley. People who are entertainers, people who are in show business, probably about half the people who called in on those programs understood that it was showbiz, had a good time talking to the men. The other half didn't quite understand what was going on, and I fear never will. So just some of the shows that stick out in my mind. And then there are the people that I work with, along with the shows that we've done. And whenever you talk about people that you work with, especially when you work with 40 or 50 people, you always run the risk of leaving somebody out. So I'm not going to run that risk tonight. But I would be very remiss if I did not mention two people. The first is David Fowler. A strange man. Not an easy man to know. Not an easy man to like. But if you put the time and the effort into it, you're well rewarded with a good friend. I've told the story of my first encounter with David, which is very bizarre. I won't go through it again. If you heard it, great. If you didn't, such is life. But David befriended me very early on in my tenure here. I would go over to his house two or three nights a week. We would sit there and talk. We shared much in common. We're both very insecure men who are totally obsessed with what we do for a living. Both very opinionated. And we would argue and scream at each other. And sometimes we would just sit there and laugh. And sometimes we would just sit there and basically look at each other. David taught me a great deal. Primarily by just letting me sit and watch him. I've learned far more in this business from watching people than from listening to them or from asking them questions. David taught me a lot. I shall always always be grateful, not only for what he taught me, but for the friendship that he extended as well. The second person I would be very remiss in not mentioning would be my producer, Michael Serio, who is as much a part of the show as I am, because Michael, you see, is my only contact with the outside world. Michael is my audience. When I'm doing something that I hope is humorous, I only know if it's working if Michael's laughing. If I'm doing a monologue or in the midst of a heavy show, if I look up through the glass and I see Michael is engrossed in the program, then I know I'm doing well. If I look up and I see he's reading or staring around the room or whatever, I know I have major problems. The ideas that he has brought to the program have been invaluable. Some of our shtick, some of our stunts, 
or Michaels. I thank him. I shall miss him much. The two years here at the radio station have been relatively rocky. No, not, not that rocky. Just rocky as in rocky roads. Some names that stick out are Tanine, Ed Bush, and George Yoakum. Oh, my. It is so, so good. I'm David Fowler. How are you? You'll be better if you listen now and get your hands on a jar of mineral ice. Mineral ice, the pain fighter, the remarkable product for the relief of those, those minor aches and pains. We all have them. Mineral ice relieves you. You'll feel the pain let go. That's remarkable. You'll feel your muscles relax when you apply mineral ice. And you may use it as often as you need it. There's no, there's no staining, there's no grease, no odor. With that deep, penetrating, cool blue mineral gel for the relief of your pain, mineral ice. You're going to work better. You're going to play better. You're even going to sleep better thanks to mineral ice. And cool's the key word here. It really penetrates. It really relieves your pain. Yes, it's as good as a say. Mineral ice available throughout the Tampa Bay area. You can get it at all general nutrition centers, Walgreens, Gray Drugs, and Eckerd Drugs, too. Remember the name Mineral Ice. All sides of the issues from all sides of the Bay. That's what you'll hear every day on WPLP. You see, we cover the Bay as never before, bringing you the news that's important to you. And we reach out with our free long-distance and local lines to gather the emotions and the ideas of the people of Tampa Bay to give you something to think about. It's another reason why we say WPLP. We're the talk of Tampa Bay. I disagree with everything you say, Bob. Fifty the time. Artanine was the man who hired me originally at WPLP. I'll never forget his first offer. It was a whopping twelve thousand dollars. Not a week, not a month, but annually. I was starving in the gutter. It was a hell of a lot more money than I was making. And I refused it. And glad I did. He eventually came around with something a little bit better. Now Art was not a stingy man. Art was not a mean man. But Art worked for very stingy people. The philosophy here at, that, at the radio station at that time was hire him as cheap as you possibly can. Whatever the hell happens, so be it. They stay for a month, they stay for a year, they stay for a lifetime. So what? There's always more where they came from. Art was a weak man. He wanted to be a manager. He wanted to be in management. But he lacked the initiative and the spunk to do it. He was basically a very good man, one of the most intelligent men I've ever met. A man with a tremendous sense of humor, but a man who never quite understood the business. He had been in it for quite some time. His credentials in terms of the call letters and places that he had worked are enough to choke a horse. We're talking about Boston, Washington, Detroit, Denver, and WPLP. Personally, I liked art. Professionally, it was nothing but a stormy road. I was here, let's see, from September through April, or March, actually, it was when Art met his demise. And I don't think there was a week that went by when I didn't threaten to quit. There was hardly a week that went by where there was not some type of terrible, awful, screaming, shouting argument. And yet he enjoyed my program. He enjoyed my work. But Art was under the influence of a man named Ed Bush. Ed Bush was the consultant. Consultants are strange people. Consultants are kind of like what we used to say about teachers. There are those who can, and there are those who can't. Those who can do, those who can't teach. Well, a consultant is kind of like a teacher. A consultant is primarily a salesman who goes to other salesmen, general managers at radio stations, and sells them an idea, a product. A consultant does nothing but criticize. Everything is wrong. Everybody is wrong. That's what a consultant's job is. We used to have to talk with a consultant once a week on a speakerphone, sitting there in a bare little room with the program director and the great Ed Bush on the other end of the phone. Ed was paid thousands of dollars a month for this. He would, he would listen to a tape, perhaps one hour of your show, 
and call up three or four days later and sit there and just belittle and ridicule you. Things like, well, at 19 minutes after three that day, you had a caller on who said such and such, and you responded by saying such and such and such. Why? Why didn't you say blah, 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 blah? Well, obviously, this is designed so that you can't answer it. This is designed so that you sit there and you're constantly on the defensive. And you go, oh, 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 oh gee, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, I guess I didn't think of it. And Ed would come back with something like, well, if you were really working hard, you would have thought of it, wouldn't you? Well, I put up with this for three weeks. And the fourth week, I went into the little room with Artanine, and Ed Bush's number was dialed up. And he came on the little speaker phone, and both Art and I sat there looking, excuse me, looking at the speaker as though we were in church. And there was Ed Bush's booming voice. Now, this is a man who used to do a syndicated talk show on the station. Ed would do exciting topics like, and this is not an exaggeration, this is the gospel. Ed would do exciting topics like, call up and tell me how much regular gasoline is selling for in your neighborhood. Well, Ed started in this afternoon about, well, I listened to the show you did three or four days ago, and oh, and this and that, and oh, and it was, what do you have to say for yourself? And I said, Ed, it's real easy to criticize me. And you have the advantage of just having listened to the show. Not only didn't I listen to it, but I did it days ago, and I don't remember anything about it. But, Ed, I, I can't help but feel that it would be so much better... If you would tell me what it was that you liked that I did instead of what you don't like. Because that way I'd know what you wanted. Wouldn't you agree, Ed? And there was silence. Absolute dead silence. And finally there was... Well, yeah, well, you did this that I really liked, and you did that that I really liked, and you did the other thing that I really liked. And I said, thanks, Ed, now we know was the last time I ever had to talk to Ed Bush. He couldn't deal with that. I had figured him out. And then there was George Yoakum. George was a general manager here. He was a nice man, curly hair, cute little mustache, always wore suspenders. His clothes were always coordinated, even down to his shoes. George worked here for about nine months. He never brought anything into his office. The walls were bare. There was nothing on his desk. And he went back home to Cleveland, Ohio, once every two weeks. We kind of got the feeling relatively early on that George wasn't going to stay. Well, George was both a fan and a non-believer. Almost every night I would come in to go to work, George would be standing there waiting for me to talk gleefully about my previous evening's show. Because he really enjoyed them, he stayed up and went out of his way to listen to them. But George didn't believe in me. While he enjoyed what I was doing, he was confident that no one else would. Especially clients. George is the one that put me on at nights. Because George was afraid of me in the afternoon. We had fours and fives in afternoon drive. George couldn't deal with that. He put me on at night. Afternoons went down to twos, sometimes less. George left. Good riddance, George. You're a nice guy. But, George, I just don't think you had any idea what you were doing. And then there was another man, Don Richards. Don Richards was both a fan of this program and a foil. Don is the man who has to sit home and sweat bullets. Oh, my God, what is he going to say next? Rest easy, my friend. You can sleep after this evening. I never got to know most of the other people who worked at this radio station. It's just one of the, one of the peculiar quirks in the business. It was either a matter that they didn't work at the same time I did, or... They were around when I was preparing a program. I am not a nice man an hour before the show. I am nervous. I am depressed and scared. So anybody who is around me an hour or so before the program is of the opinion that I am one of the meanest, 
rudest, boorish people on the face of the earth. They don't know that I'm sitting there trembling, wondering how in God's name I'm going to fill the next three hours. And what am I going to do if nobody calls or the phone system goes out or whatever it might be. So as I said, I never got to know most of the other people who worked at this radio station, nor did they ever get to know me. By the way, it's only fair warning for my new co-workers that you understand that as well. It's not a damn thing I can do about it. It's the way it is. If you want to get to know me, come around after the show, not before it. There are so many other things I want to say, so many other things I want to cover. Reasons, basically, or things, I should say, that have happened here in the last couple of years. The overwhelming majority of them good, fond memories. Some of them damned funny. And some of them somewhere in between. There was the great Uzoff. Now, one of the people who attended the Uzoff begged and pleaded with me tonight not to mention it. Well, I can't, I can't possibly leave here without telling you about the great Uzoff. However, I won't mention names. It's not that important. And then, of course, there is the reason I shall always, always remember WPLP. It's because I fell in love here. Coming up on the 9 o'clock hour, CBS News headed your way. Please, whatever you do, don't venture very far. We're going to play a hiding and finding game with music. Now, this is what we do. We pretend that you've got some balls, and I'm going to hide them. They might be hidden high up near the ceiling. Or they might be hidden low down on the floor. You don't know where I'm going to hide your balls, but the music will tell you. Now, first of all, shut your eyes while I hide them. Yes, shut your eyes. Now, open your eyes and dance lightly about looking everywhere for your balls. And now the music's going to tell you where your balls are. They may be high up so that you have to stretch and jump up for them, or they may be low down so that you have to pick them up off the floor. Listen. Well, were your balls high up or low down? They were high up. And I hope you've all jumped up and got them. Now, dance round and toss them in the air and play with them. Hello! Hello! Stop bringing me, do you hear? Answer me! Who is this? You realize you're driving me crazy? Who's calling me? What are you doing it for? Now stop it! Stop it! Stop it! It's after the hour of 9 o'clock. Welcome back. Hour number two for this Friday night, August 28th, 1987. I'm Bob Lasseter with you until 11. I remember so well the first day I came up here. I had come up to do some vacation fill and had driven up from Miami, and I was sitting out in the lobby talking to the receptionist. And down the hall came a woman dressed in a, a red dress with blonde curly hair. And I was smitten immediately. Her name was Mary. She was the business manager, and she took an instant disliking to me. I would sit there in the afternoons, waiting to go on, talking with a receptionist, who was Mary's subordinate. 
It's not that the receptionist disliked Mary, but she thought she was much too tough, and she would sit there and complain to me about the business manager. And I would sit there and nod my head and listen and hoping against hope that this woman with fantastic legs would walk down the hall again so I could see her. The days and the weeks and the months passed and I finally came back here to work full time. And I didn't think I was going to stay. I was only going to be here for a relatively short time. And I didn't really know anybody inside or outside of the station. And I noticed that Everybody congregated in Mary's office. And they would go in there and laugh and giggle and tell jokes and stories. But I was never invited. I would always sit outside as anybody and everybody would just walk through the door into Mary's office and have a good time. And I would sit out in the outer office alone. Well, one day, one of the other girls who worked here came to me and said, Hey, we're all going to meet at Cahoots in Clearwater after work. Why don't you come on up when you get off? And I said, well, well, me? Well, who, who all's going to be there? And she said, oh, well, so-and-so will be there, and so-and-so, and so-and-so, and so-and-so, and Mary, and so-and-so. And I said, oh, yeah, I'll be there. And so I got off work at 7 o'clock. Or no, it was 8 o'clock. I was working until late in those days. And I drove in a blinding rainstorm to Cahoots, which is about maybe 13, 14, 15 miles from this radio station. Up US 19, a horrible road, watching accidents taking place all around me, driving as fast as I dare drive on basically bald tires. And I arrived at Cahoots. And I couldn't get a parking place close to the door, and I mean, it is pouring. And I parked maybe 150 feet away and I got out and I ran through this downpour, got drenched, got to the front door. And the doorman stopped me and said, are you looking for so-and-so and so-and-so? And I said, yes. They said, oh, well, they left. But uh, you can meet them at, he gave me the name of another bar, just a couple of blocks from this radio station. And I said, oh. And I went back out and <clears throat> walked through the rain slowly to my car. And I started to drive home. And I didn't live very far away from this bar. And at the last minute, I decided, oh, what the hell? I'll go over there. And I walked in, drenched, hair plastered to my head. And there was everybody sitting around the table including Mary and her boyfriend. I took one look at the party and said, oh, what the hell? There was only one seat left at the table, and it was right next to Mary. And I sat down and I said, any of you people ever, uh, ever had Uzo? And one or two had said yes and started to giggle. I called the waitress over and I said, do you people serve Uzo here? And she said yes. There were about seven or eight of us at the table. During the next two hours, we drank 22 rounds. But, uh, no, I take that back. 22 shots of Uzo. Several people left after the first 45 minutes. And so it was really just down to about four or five of us sitting there just, just drinking Uzo. Mary got a little tipsy, spilled her drink in my lap. And finally, everybody got up and left and... I was stuck with this humongous bill for all this ouzo I had bought. And I left. Well, at least it gave me enough that was the great Uzoff. By the way, the next day, I was the only one of that group who made it to work. The next day, I figured, what the hell? I'll start going into Mary's office when she comes back to work. And I did. And a strange thing happened. Fewer and fewer people would congregate in Mary's office, and pretty soon it was just her and I. And I would hang around that office for... I, I'd come into work two or three hours early, just to go in there and stand and chat about anything she wanted to chat about. Anything. Made no difference at all. And then I started listening to Dateline. 
just so I could hear her voice on Saturdays. Would sit there in my lonely little apartment, listening to a show I despised, just to hear Mary. And this went on for months. And she had never given me any great encouragement, nor had I ever made any great advances. And I finally decided, Lassiter, you're making a fool of yourself. An absolute fool of yourself. Cut it out. And so I agreed. Well, it was a Sunday, an early June, late June rather, very, very hot day. And there was a Dateline party. And I figured, what the hell? I'll get dressed and I'll go to the Dateline party and see if I can't meet somebody. And I went to the Dateline party. And I met someone. Mary. So for no other reason, I shall always remember WPLP with the greatest of fondness. See, I'm both happy and sad to be leaving WPLP. I'm happy because... I'm going to get off of these miserable nights. Oh, I hate working at night with a passion. And I'm sad because I have a lot of friends here. That it's very, very comfortable, and I am a creature of habit. I mean, I'm sitting in a room surrounded by the most ugly, filthy, cigarette-stained curtains you can begin to imagine. And a very funky building at the end of a dead-end street that is not paved... And yet somehow it's very comfortable. It's home. There is one thing I must say about this radio facility. It has the most comfortable and the quietest chairs I have ever worked with in my entire life. You can sit in these chairs for days on end. And they never make any noise. I mean, you can sit here and rock back and forth. And they don't make any noise. I've never encountered that before in my entire life. So today is the last one. And on Monday, there is another radio station. And I'm very fearful and nervous, and yet at the same time very confident in going over there. New jobs are not fun. You've got to figure out where the hell the men's room is, who you have to pay for coffee, if anyone. And it will take at least three months before I remember all of the names of the various different people. They will think I'm very rude. I just can't put names and faces together. And it will only be after I embarrass myself that I will finally remember what name goes with which face. I leave the station, and I wish them all of the best in the world. This place deserves success. These people deserve success. And yet at the same time, I'm out to literally bury them. I mean, I want ratings, big ratings, that are going to come, if they come, at the expense of this radio station. My new job is very complicated. I would explain it to you if I could. I will not even be on the air regularly for quite some time. Actually, I'm not even sure of what I'm going to be doing. I was driving into work tonight and found out that I will be working 3 to 7 next week. I didn't even know that. I heard it on the radio coming to work. Nobody else bothered to tell me. But I assume it was true. They said it on the radio, so therefore it must be true. I leave this one for one reason and one reason only. The nights. I go to the news station because I want to. Now maybe that sounds like a paradox, a contradiction. And I suppose it is. But then my life has been nothing but a paradox and a contradiction. Nighttime. In the city of Tampa Bay, unlike night anywhere else, and no other radio station lights up the night like News Talk 57, WPLP. We are the talk of Tampa Bay. 20 minutes after the hour of 9 o'clock, I'm very proud, very proud indeed of what was accomplished here at this radio station by this voice. Yet I'm very sorry that it couldn't have been much more. This radio station was in a flux when I arrived. It's in a flux as I leave for different reasons, but that doesn't make any difference. We achieved a reasonable degree of success in terms of the ratings. I wish it could have even been higher. We achieved less than a reasonable degree of success in terms of selling advertising time, such as life. For the most part, my stay here has been a very pleasant one. 
My relationship with management has been very cordial. Although, to tell you the truth, I could never quite figure out if it was cordial because they respected me or if it was cordial because they were afraid of me. Some very strange things happened. I do a very controversial program. I could never quite figure it out. The day after a controversial program, the management here would go to my board operator, go to the executive producer, go to the receptionist, go to anyone and say, Why did he do that? Why did he say that? And yet they would never ask me. As I said, I could, I will never know if it was out of respect or out of fear. I'd like to think it was fear. Without any exception, everything I did at this radio station was precisely 180 degrees away from what they wanted at first when I arrived. They did not want monologues. I gave them monologues, including two three-hour monologues. They did not want shows without guests. I don't like shows with guests. They didn't want theme shows. They wanted the topic to change every hour. They would say to me, Oh, my God, people will get bored and they won't listen. If Oh, you got to change the topic constantly. Well, I would reply, Well, if the topic is good enough, they won't get bored. And if it's so bad that it should be changed every hour, then we shouldn't be doing it anyway. And they'd say, Oh, but look at these research reports and the you know, consultant says, and Oh, you got to do it this way. And I would come in and do it my way. Well, believe it or not, about two months ago, I was hauled into the office. And they said to me, Why aren't you doing the monologues? Oh, my God, the people love the monologues. I got a letter here from a listener that says he doesn't do monologues anymore. Oh, why don't you do the monologues? <sighs> I'm not a good employee. I'm a very bad employee. I do things that I don't get paid to do. I don't get paid to make decisions, and yet I make them. I decide what I like and what I don't like. I mean, let me give you an example. The weather forecasted 35 minutes after the hour. I went from February 1986 until three days ago without doing a weather forecast. Nothing was ever said to me. A year and a half. I mean, it's on the log. Right here on the log, at 35 minutes after the hour, it says, weather. And I never did it, because I didn't like it. I figured, you guys ain't listening to this damn thing to hear the weather. Now, if there was a hurricane coming or something like that, then you'd want to know about it. And if there was a hurricane coming, we're not going to make you wait an hour in between telling you. We're going to be telling you all the time. Hurricane on the way, but unfortunately, you'll have to wait until 9.35 to find out about it. Meanwhile, let's talk about uh, plants with a plant lady here. Plant lady. Okay, you get my, get my drift? Well, again, I can't figure out if it's because they were afraid to confront me with the weather or if it was because they just never noticed that it sounded so damn good without it. By the way, you'll notice that we're not doing it tonight either. Nor did we do it last night. I mean, I gave them two nights of the weather, damn it. Two nights out of a year and a half, that's not too bad. And none of, none of you ever complained. I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters of complaint about Lassiter down in the public file. And not one of the damn things says, and he doesn't do the weather. They complain about he doesn't like the president, he doesn't like God enough, or whatever it might be. But nobody ever wrote in and said, and he doesn't do the weather. Now, I must also point out, that there isn't one letter in there that says, I like Tim Coles because he does the weather. Nobody ever complained, nobody ever noticed. But I'm not a good employee. You see, I never expected to stay at WPLP. This was just to be practice, you see. I was working in Miami on the weekends. And to tell you the truth, I made more money working two days a week in Miami than these people paid me to work five days a week. They had been after me and after me and after me for months, they being Artanine. Come up here and work. Come up here and work. And I would say, no, 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 no. Because, no, it gets worse. The only other time I was really called into George's office 
was shortly after our ratings book came out. And George sat behind his desk. And he ranted. And he raved. And he said, last of the year, 25 to 54 are down, 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 down. You're losing all your 25 to 54 audience, Lassiter. I can't have this. And on top of that, Lassiter, you have too many 25 to 54. I need older people. We patted him on the head and said, yes, George, we'll work on that. He said, thank you. Please close the door when you leave. <sighs> the, other, the other crisis that I faced here came shortly after I arrived. I had done a program on religion. Well, this market had never heard a program on religion quite like that because this one wasn't praising God. This one was suggesting that there might not be one as conceived by the Judeo-Christians. Well, the program director was pacing in the halls. I mean, he was really upset. And after the show, he confronted me out in the lobby. And he had in his hand what we refer to in this business as the book. The book is the ratings report. And I had never seen this man angry before. I had not seen him angry since. He was a very mild, easygoing man. And he's waving the book in my face, saying, We want a book full of friends! You can't get friends doing shows on religion! And I said, I don't want a book full of friends! I want a book full of listeners! And I'll get tons of them if I do shows like that! And he said, We want a book full of friends! And I said, You don't want friends! That's all you've got in there! And you hardly have any! Let me do shows on religion and I'll get you some damn listeners! There were a couple of other crises. I'll tell you about those in a moment. Bob Evans and Cheryl Brown. Oh, you young men don't know what a thrill it is for me to be up here this afternoon addressing you. We want all you Cub Scouts to know that you should pick your own leader. Who can be like myself, either a male or female or a combination of both? the time. Ah, yes, Bob Evans. <sighs> the executive producer, for whatever reason is beyond me, is forced under the pain of dismissal to write up every day what we refer to in the business as a promo sheet. For example, there's one here before me for this very Friday the 28th, and it says things like, The John Eastman Show, 2 to 5 p.m. The spotlight shines on the John Eastman Show this afternoon. At 2 p.m. as Brenda Vaccaro joins John Eastman in studio for an in-depth look at stage and screen with a gifted performer and dynamic individual appearing, etc., 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 okay? Well, I rarely have a guest. And so every day this poor woman has the, the ungodly, unthankful task of coming up with something to put under my name that no one's ever going to read anyway. For example, today it says, Bob Lasseter takes it to the limit tonight with an open forum you don't want to miss. Some immediate answers to the unanswered questions that have been plaguing your psyche are revealed this evening on the Bob Lasseter Show here on News Talk 57 WPLP. Well, one night, she wrote on the promo sheet that I would be doing a remote broadcast from the parking lot of a Bob Evans restaurant. And I came in here and I sat down and I had nothing better to do. And I'm listening to the newscast at the top of the hour before my show begins, and so I said to Michael, my producer, throw some static on the line. And I came on in the spur of the moment and said, hi, we're doing this remote broadcast from the parking lot of the Bob Evans, but unfortunately, we can't tell you which one. So you'll have to call and ask. Well, this is a reasonably popular radio program, and apparently all of the area Bob Evans were filled with phone calls all night long, wanting to know one of two things. Either if indeed I was there, or people telling them that they would never eat again at the Bob Evans because I was there. Well, we did the entire three hours and thought nothing of it. The next morning, the phone rings at the radio station. 
that it's one of the managers from Bob Evans. And he said, oh, my God, it was great. Oh, wait, can, can we get a remote here with, with, with Lassiter? I mean, oh, oh, the response was fantastic. And so the person on the other end of the phone said something to the effect of, well, you know, I thought I'd get in touch with the sales office. Uh, yeah, sure. And we were all thrilled. Well, a few minutes later, the phone rings, and it's some... Um, <laughs> ah, what the hell? It was some bozo from Bob Evans headquarters up in who knows what Ohio. And he's screaming. We're going to cancel our ad! This is terrible! How dare he mention it? We're canceling our ad! And so the person on the other end of the phone hears that Oh, 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 please don't do it. Oh, this is terrible. Not even realizing that Bob Evans does not advertise for the station, never has. Well, something in the neighborhood of fourteen or $1,500 later in legal fees. After a while, by the way, it was pointed out to Bob that he didn't advertise here. And he said, well, I was going to. And now I'm not. Finally, Bob Evans went away. And then there was the Cheryl Brown show. One of the most popular we have ever done. Well, we took the premise that Cheryl, who is probably a very nice woman, is stuck working for this radio station, or this television station, that no doubt has a consultant that has her making these very silly promos and has her acting in a very subservient manner to John Wilson during the newscast. And we ran with it for three hours. Well, some of our listeners called Channel 10, and they said, Lassiter's on there calling Cheryl Brown a slut and a whore! Well, Channel 10, probably run by people who used to run WPLP, without stopping to think about anything, threatened beyond belief. They wanted my hide. They were going to sue. They were going to do this. They were going to do that. They were going to come over and let the air out of my tires. I mean, they were going to chop the tower down. They just weren't going to have this. And I don't know who it was, either the station or poor Cheryl Brown, who spent a fortune. I mean, I'm saying serious money in attorney's fees. And like two months later, get around to listening to the tape, which they should have done immediately. And of course, found out that I didn't call Cheryl a slut and a whore. Of course not. What are you, I'm crazy? I can get sued for doing that. And finally, they went away, too. And there was one last crisis during my tenure here, which didn't actually directly involve me. But it's one that I shall scratch my head over for the rest of my life and never quite understand. When I did afternoon drive here, there was a man doing the evening, the evening program named Chris James. Chris is a damn nice man, and I actually like him very, very much. But Chris was bad. Chris was boring. Chris would come in here with 30 or 40, and I do not exaggerate, newspaper articles that he would cut out with great care before his program and sit here and read them and look at the phone to see if they got any response, and if they didn't, he'd read some more. And there were many an evening when Chris didn't get a half a dozen calls in his entire program. Chris used to complain bitterly to management that he had a bad lead-in. Now, in this business, lead-in means the show that's on before you. Chris had the highest-rated Tampa Bay talk show on before him. There was hardly a night that I left without a full board of calls, which would immediately drop off as soon as Chris came in the studio. It's almost as though the people fenced it. Ah, uh, I just don't understand. Ah, uh, yes, there was another one, too. Two of my colleagues, who shall go unnamed, have argued very, very strongly with various different management here at the radio station for my immediate departure. I, of course, have also argued for their immediate departure. The same, too. Neither side was victorious. There were other memorable evenings at the radio station. There was a night when one of my competitors, another talk show host and another station, called off the air because I had mentioned him in a favorable light. And he called off the air, and I took the phone call during one of the breaks to hear him squealing with delight and joy 
that his name had been mentioned on the Bob Lasseter show. It tickled me pink. Ah, uh, there were... There was the tragic interview with Mr. Marbles that I shall never forget. There were the four hours that I did with Yoki in here when the listening audience called in and tore this station to shreds and Yoki and I sat here and laughed till we hurt. There was Mr. Airstream when Rocky got me and got me good. An eight-minute long phone call that I was convinced was some old goat living in a trailer park who had just lost it. I wished he had never, ever, ever let us know otherwise. I've learned a lot here at WPLP. What have I learned? Well, I've learned how to get excused early from a staff meeting. Let me tell you about it. I will not name this individual. But I will tell you in advance that it is the last one that you would expect to do this. Yoki loved monthly staff meetings where he would sit there and read to us from his notes on a legal pad about things of which we cared not a bit. And we were going through one of these, and this individual, for all practical purposes, no reason under the sun, just stood up and started screaming and shouting and flailing his arms about, This is all a bunch of bullfeathers! Well, he actually used a different word than bullfeathers, but for the purposes of keeping the station on the air, we'll say bullfeathers. And he just started ranting and raving and hollering over and over again, Ball feathers! Ball feathers! I've been in this business for 30 years! All these meetings are ball feathers! Ball feathers! And stomps out the door. Not a word was said. It was as though nothing had happened. I mean, we're talking about a man going on for like two, three minutes, stomping his foot, waving his arms about the room, screaming at the top of his lungs. Not a word was said. I should also point out there has only been one staff meeting since then. You know who you are, and I thank you very much. I learned other things here, too. I learned that not only is there something to the theory of a full moon, but I learned that there is definitely something to the theory of a new moon. And I learned how to get coffee. It took me almost two years. But one day I finally figured out that if I did three hours, complaining bitterly about management not leaving coffee out for the night crew that it just might work and it did. And to this day, there is coffee out there waiting for us. So these are just a few of the things that have gone through my mind that I thought I would share with you. I don't know what else to say. Let me give you the... Did you hear that poor thing crying like he does? Well, it breaks my heart, but, you know, when the phones aren't lit, that breaks my heart yeah, even that... more. You, you know, oh, you do what shame. you have to do. Oh, shame on you. Go, go jump in a lake and, and uh, have somebody to hold your head under the water for by hour. I'm not holding his head under the water. I'm just holding him by the tail and dunking him in yeah, the bucket. Yeah, put him in the water. How would you like that? Oh, I, was, I, I wish I was close to you with a, with a rolling pin. Rolling oh. pin? I sure do. I'm going to call the PCA, too, and report you. All right. This is getting out of hand. Just one additional, very brief thing before we get to the phone calls. Many of you saw an article in the newspaper this morning, the Tampa Tribune, wherein the program director of WFLA is quoted as saying, I can say this. The man, referring to me, can eat a hell of a lunch. Well, yes, Dick Norman and I have had lunch on, I believe, three different occasions. I hasten to point out that Mr. Norman finished his lunch each and every time. I left some of mine behind twice. And on all three occasions, Mr. Norman insisted upon dessert. Now, I only had dessert twice. So I think Mr. Norman is, uh, talking through his hat. Don't tell me I got a, another one on my hand. Tampa, you're on the air at WPLP. How you doing, Bob? Fine, thank you. Good, good. First of all, Coach, this is, uh, it's 84 degrees in Ridge Manor tonight. 
Oh, great. And my Spanish setter is still under the front porch. Okay. Just wait for him. Good deal. Bob, let's get off of Tim Cole. Who gives a dang about Tim Cole? Everybody. Okay. <laughs> the puddles at the end of the dirt road. Yes. I have a puddle at the end of my dirt road, too. I hate it. I... Yeah, but you're not supposed to be a big, you know, top market uh, radio station. I know it. And this is embarrassing. I've never worked at a radio. I mean, even W-O-U-R, which is a real pig. I mean, I want to tell you, it was a pig. Yeah. Even W-O-U-R, you know, had a paved parking lot, and it was on a paved street. I hate going to the shelf station three times a week. (laughs) This is disgraceful, that puddle out there. Disgraceful. Okay. We all have bosses. We all have bosses. I have got some stories about my bosses. Won't go into it. But, Bob, you're telling us about your bosses. Man, I guarantee you, 85% of the people out here can relate. <laughs> That's why the bosses don't like me talking about them. <laughs> well, they the They know that the listeners would would understand and probably raise up and revolt against them. That's right. Yeah. The bosses are clocked out, so the hell with the bosses. Something like that. Let's talk about them. I already did. <laughs> What's that? I already did. What he did? I said, I already did. Talk you already did? Them. Yeah. Well... <laughs> Considering my boss is my father, we better not go into it right here and now. Okay. I tell you what, one other point, real quick, jumping, jumping tracks, is uh, see the article about Gordon Soley in the Tribune yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. I did. Tell him the Tribune. I enjoyed seeing that. I'm well. At least I'm glad I found out what happened. I right, thank you much, my friend. Yeah. Be good. Bob, take it easy, Bubba. Will do. Same feature on the air at WPLP. Bob. Yes. Good evening, sir. Good evening. I uh, just got back in town. I've been gone about 10 days. I understand you're not going to be around, at least on the, uh, this part of the dial. That's Too correct. Longer. I don't know where you're going, but I remember the days when you were a TV. I uh, beg your pardon? I remember the days. No, no. What did you say before that? Pardon me, sir. What, what did you say before that, before you remember the days? You said something about I don't I don't know where, where what? Oh, no. I, re- I remember when you were at TBS and uh, INZ down in Miami. And the shows that people seem to get upset with you about up here could not compare with some of the shows you did down there. One that... Well, I was considered the, the reasonable talk show. Came, oh, most definitely. Most definitely. And I don't want to name any names down there, but there, many of them are still there. And, you know, the, the switch and the changes that have gone on down there with... Yeah, there were a couple of talk shows down there. there wish, you know, up. wherever you're going, I wish you, if you could get out your script, and I know you don't work off a script, but if you could do the one on why some adults should not be parents. I heard that when you were still at TBS, that's when you were doing weekends down there, I believe, and uh, or you were doing weeks down there and weekends up here. I don't remember what it was. It was a couple of years ago. Excellent show. The audience is totally different down there. I don't think they're open and receptive. I don't agree with everything that you say. Good God, man. I don't agree with everything I say. It is stimulating conversation. Uh, it causes people to think. Uh, people that are closed-minded that say, well, I don't agree with this, so he's got to be a communist or gay or something. That's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. I don't, you know, I don't come up with that attitude. I turn my wife on to talk radio, friends at work. Uh, we used to have what you would call, you. <laughs> I was laughing earlier, you you uh, said you worked at a beautiful music program station. Oh, there was a buddy of mine in Lakeland that does the same thing. Oh, great. It's one of the hardest it's ways to earn a living. He hates it. I, I, even when I was in Pittsburgh earning big money, it is such an incredibly boring job. Oh, These shifts are six hours long. This friend of mine over in Lakeland, he sits there and says, he reads a lot of books, and I think that's probably where some of our greatest talk show hosts come from. They do beautiful music. Yes, and they've done all that reading. I used they to do the read same 300 thing. bucks. I, well, I went out and bought a $300 chess computer <laughs> and would sit there and play chess all night long, Love it. listening to talk radio. Yeah. When I was in Pittsburgh, yeah. the uh, EBS station was KDKA. Yeah. And so I would just throw the I EBS... I that station, too. Cause... I would just throw the EBS monitor on and yeah. sit there listening to Roy Fox playing right. chess. Right. Yeah, well, I don't know where you're going, but I hope I can still get you on my radio here in this area. But I'll tell you this. This is crazy, because I still do spend a lot of time down in the South Florida market. You mentioned Neil Rogers a little earlier. Of course, you know what he's going through down there. And uh, it, it's a rut. I, I go to, you know, Miami Lauderdale for about a week at a time, and I'm back in, you know, the West Coast here in St. Pete, Tampa. And, my God, people complain about things up here. Or, you know, they bitch and moan about uh, talk show hosts and so forth. And I said, 
God, you know, if their radios could pull in what's going on down there, <laughs> you run a tame show up here compared to what you used to do and compared to some of the other people down there. Oh, they'll never know. They'll never know. Yeah, I love it, though. And don't ever stop what you're doing. Because I've never called before in my entire life. I met you at a, you did a remote at uh, a shopping mall down in Maximo, down in South St. Pete on US 19 South, 34th mm -hmm. Street. Mm -hmm. And you and I sat down and had a hot dog one afternoon while we were doing a remote there. And, uh, uh, let's see, Dave Fowler was there, you were there. And there, Art Deneen happened to be there. And I just happened to hear you coming across the skyway. You were talking about Art a little earlier. Big old bearded guy. And, uh... And it was, it was kind of interesting listening to that because I was down there that day and, uh, you know, just walking through the audience, my wife and I were down there doing some shopping and you could you could see the group standing, you know. Here was this group, you know, here's the Tim Cole fans, here's the Dave Fowler fans, you know, and here's the Bob Lasseter fans and they didn't talk much about each other. It was like kind of rooting for football teams, you know. <laughs> Who had the most fans there? But anyhow, I love your show. I love... I listen to everybody there, and I don't always agree with everybody. I, you know, I, I must admit up front, probably uh, you and Dave are the most entertaining. Uh, and whether I agree or disagree or agree to disagree, don't ever change. I won't. Please, Thank you, Mike. Don't ever change. I won't. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right. Have a good one. Take care. Bye-bye. Didn't have the nerve to tell him I've never done a remote at Maximum Plaza in my life, nor is the station. Sun City Center. Hi, you're on the air, WPLP. You probably saw you at West Shore. Well, I can understand how you'd easily get West Shore and Tampa mixed up with Maximo Plaza, which is yeah. now by the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. That was about Bridge. the nicest two hours that I've ever listened to on the radio. The nicest two hours at, at West Shore? No, that you just... Well, the past two hours on the radio. Ah, the little farewell comment. It was... After Wednesday night... I was determined to listen tonight for the whole, every minute. But I want to ask you three questions, if I may. Sure. Did Wednesday night, now that I heard that lady, that old lady talking about calling the SPCA, was that all tape Wednesday night? No, that was all live. Was it really? Sure. I just cannot understand how you could do what you did. Wednesday night. And I was very amused by it. And then do what you did tonight, amused or not. It's so different. It's 100% different personality. Well, that's what I try to do. I try to do something different every night. Okay. My two questions are, mm -hmm. you said at one point around 9 o'clock, I decided, uh, talking about Mary, I decided, Lasseter, quit making a fool of yourself. My that's phone, right. My phone rang. I said, I can't talk now. I got back, and I missed what you said next. What happened next? Oh, okay. Well, I decided to quit hanging around Mary's office. Yeah. And there was a Dateline party coming up that weekend, and I decided to go to the Dateline party to see if I could meet somebody. You met her? Yes. Oh. We sat there uh, after the Dateline party uh, at the bar, drinking and talking uh, from 6 o'clock until about 11.30. Oh. She was drinking Amaretto's, and I was drinking Black Russians. Oh, this was the, the best night. My other question is, you said something a few minutes ago about you were sorry you found out that Rocky was not... Some old redneck or something. Right, Mr. Airstream. What is he? Well, he Rocky had called up with a character that we dubbed Mr. Airstream, and he totally fooled me. And I was just bitterly disappointed that there really wasn't this old man out there in the trailer parks going berserk over my show. <laughs> Got to run him out of time for this hour. Okay, good luck. Take care. One day, when the truth comes out, monuments will be built in his honor all over the world. His name will be a shining light, an inspiration for generations and generations of people. God, it sounds great, doesn't it? Welcome back. Uh, Friday night, August the 28th, 1987. Bob Lasseter with you for this third and final hour. Tampa, hi. You're on the air to WPLP. Mad Dog. Yes? I want to tell you how much, first of all, that I have enjoyed listening to your show while I sit out here on the porch and enjoy the Florida weather. Especially, uh, although you didn't like doing them, the Saturday night shows that you've done. Oh, oh, oh the pain and agony. 
Yeah, I know. I knew you would feel that way, but I really enjoyed it. Another thing, um, the lady in my life tells me that you did a piece on the brain-damaged snowbirds. Oh, yes. And you mentioned them one night last week. Uh, I guess it was Thursday night. Yes, I was wondering, you know, what do they do in the summer? Right, that's what can, can the people back in Iowa or wherever it is that they come from notice them uh, for what they are? Let's hope. But I was wondering if you'd give me just a little recap of the man that called in and explained the point to you on the air. You know, he, he was a brain-damaged snowbird, yet he didn't realize it. Oh, I've had many of them. I can't imagine. remember any of them. Re although I heard one on an, uh, another uh, host's uh, show recently complaining bitterly, and the old guy was going on and says, And he calls all of his listeners brain-damaged snowbirds. <laughs> and if ever there was a brain-damaged snowbird, I want to tell you. I want to tell you he was it. But do these people in Iowa realize that these people are messed up? I don't, I don't know. You know, why do they let them come back every summer? You think they would keep them there? So that the sun wouldn't hurt them anymore. Keep them there. You'd think they would, you know, encourage them to move here year-round. Well, you know, who wants people walking around with plaid walking shorts and, and oxfords and blue ankle socks and those pork pie hats and those strapless T-shirts they wear, uh, sleeveless T-shirts they wear. I and you mean, can't get on a golf geez. course in front of them. Well, men even dress worse. Exactly. Oh, it's awful. Just wanted to thank you, Mag Dog, and I'm glad you're staying in the market so I can keep a tab on you. Thank you much. Thanks a lot. Be good. Bye. Temple Terrace, hi, you're on the air, WPLP. Hi. Hi. Um, I just want to say that I really like your show, and I'm going to miss you. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Bye. Bye. Largo, you're on the air at WPLP. Good evening, Robert. Good evening. Robert, I just want to ask you one question. About three weeks ago on Tuesday night, and I was calling you in, and I, and I was really upset with the callers that night. And I had asked you, I said, Robert, it's, it's been nice listening to you. And I, 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 I knew right then, I said, this is three weeks ago on Tuesday night. And I said, you're gone. And I, for some reason, there was something that clicked. I was sitting in my lounge chair, and I was listening to you with the headphones on. And I realized at that time that there, there, there was no more Bob Latch on PLP, which I, I will always admire PLP for having you on the air. But I knew at that point... Do you remember that caller? I'm, I, I know that's very vague, and uh, but you came up with a comment about an hour later, and you said that that you were you were gone. Well, I've made no secret for uh, for quite some time, probably the best part of six months, at my displeasure at working in the evenings. Okay. Well, it was not, and that, it, you know, it was, this wouldn't continue indefinitely. Okay, I understand then. I, I was to me, maybe I'm, I'm a very vague person, so. I, I I had just I couldn't believe that the your your callers were coming in that the the way the response was at the crowd that night and what they were saying and uh, I, I I I just felt like that I couldn't believe that you with the, a person of your integrity and I and I uh, admire your integrity and I think you're one of the one of the best talk show hosts and I've been uh, in several places in the country where I've listened to talk radio, and last year to me is one of the best that I've ever heard in my life. Well, you're kind, and I appreciate the words. And, uh, and I mean, these are major cities, and I think you're one of the best, and I'll be honest with you. Well, I thank you. And I appreciate your time, and I my appreciate pleasure. you being on the air. Take care. Clearwater, you're on the air, WPLP. Hi, Bob. Hi. Good farewell show, Bob. Hey, I heard uh, Dick Norman this morning. And uh, that Tom is writing him on that question, National Security Council. So I hope he doesn't follow you to the other station, uh, Bob. Um, it, last weekend, I had uh, uh, two or three different uh, new drinks that are out. And you mentioned that you like black Russians. And, uh, oh, yes, my real weakness in life. Yeah, delicious, but I'm going to well, get... are. Okay, this is a, if you, you've got a pen, you've got to write this down. It is a delicious but a very potent drink. It's, um, it's called, the name of the cocktail is Screaming Orgasm. Okay. And, uh, it's equal parts of vodka, Kahlua, and Bailey's Irish Cream. Ooh, sounds delicious. Plus, 
a dash of amaretta. Oh, sounds better still. Oh, it. I I got. Uh, uh, I haven't had black Russians, white Russians, but they get a little bland after a while. And she, this gal working the bar made three or four different. She comes up with these unusual cocktails. So I tried two others. I forgot the names of them. I love this one, Screaming Orgasm. I love the taste of it. The, I, on the Black Russian with the Bailey's Irish Cream, uh, that is also the same amount as the vodka and the Kahlua. All equal parts. Third ounce vodka, third ounce Kahlua, third ounce Bailey's Irish Cream, and a dash of Amaretta. Chill and strain. Of course, after about five of them, I started drinking right on the ice, right off the rock. <laughs> but, oh, wow, I couldn't find... After about five of them, I'm surprised you didn't just take the three bottles, you know, kind of hold them together and hold them up over, you know, over your shoulder and drink out of them. I don't recall where we went after that. We went to several places. I don't recall. Everybody well, said I was well walking, understand. walking, walk, talk, uh, walk straight, talk straight, but I had no idea where, where I was at, uh, but delicious. And um, another thing, Bob... If those rednecks start calling you tonight, just tell them to fade. Okay. I don't want to hear them tonight. Okay. All right. Be good. Yeah, bye. Tampa, you're on the air at WPLP. Good evening, sir. How good are evening. you? Good evening. Fine, thank you. Very, very interesting comments and interesting memoirs. Um, I have a couple of questions. Sure. One dealing with, you said you worked for a country station and you became Bobby Clifford. That's right. Um, what is it that... In radio, that makes people want to assume different identities as a disc jockey. I don't know. I really don't know. Bob Lasseter is my legal name. Uh, it was an accident that I worked under the name Bob Lasseter. I never intended to. I don't know what it is. I can't explain it to you why we feel this this need to to come up with a, a strange name. I guess it's maybe maybe most people are just unhappy with their names. Well, not, is it because you're afraid of being taunted in public, or or is it for your own uh, safety? Well, you for, know, for example, for personal, for personal reasons. When I started in this business, my the name I was born with is Gwodowski. You know, so there there's a real nice easy reason right there why I assumed a different name in radio. I later legally changed my name to Lassiter, but never worked under the name Lassiter. Uh, it was an accident that I started using the name Bob Lasseter on the air. Yeah. It was in Miami where I had already worked for quite some time and was known as Bobby Clifford. And when I went into talk radio, the people that hired me went ahead and had all kinds of recorded uh, promos and intros and outros and all that nonsense made using the name Bob Lasseter. They never bothered to ask me if I was going to use a different name. And so I had literally no choice. Oh. I came to work the first day, and bam, there it was. Here's Bob Lasseter. May I ask another quick question? Sure. You alluded to an article earlier in the Tribune concerning Gordon Soley. Yeah. Um, neither my husband nor I get the Tribune, nor can we read it. What happened to it? Uh, Gordon evidently was just phased out uh, in a youth movement by the company that owns the the rights to championship wrestling. Boy, that, that's sad. Yeah, it really is. I don't understand. I, I, Gordon is hes a legend. My husband is a faithful watcher of that program, and we're saying, what? Yeah, I'm, I'm really going to miss him. I think they made a tragic mistake. Do you know where he's at? Do you know what happened to him? Well, Gordon also works for several other people, and it's also my understanding that starting this Saturday, he has a new wrestling show on, uh, not, I don't know if you ever saw TNT on, uh... Yeah, I did. Okay, well, Gordon is doing a TNT type of wrestling show that starts this Saturday morning at 10, and I believe it's on Channel 28. Oh, neat. I'll have to tell my husband that, hey, listen, uh, I'm going to make the switch with you. I listen to the, those folks in the afternoon anyway, so you'll have me. Okay, thank you. You take care. You too. Bye-bye. Newport Richie. Whoops, my mistake. Let's try that. Newport Richie, hi, you're on the air. Oh, there you are. Yeah, here I is. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. Good, Bob. I'm just sick. I'm sick that you're leaving. Well, be happy for me. I'm leaving because I want to leave. I'm very pleased with where I'm going. I'm very pleased with the arrangement. And uh... Well, I mean, I guess I'm happy for you, but I'm sick for myself. <laughs> Well, I understand. I used to listen to talk radio, too. Uh, well, actually, I still do, and I used to get very fond of listening to certain people at certain times. Well, what am I going to do in the evening? Are they going to put on Tim Coles? 
know. Uh, actually, next week, at least for next week, it'll be uh, Rick Marin will be sitting in uh, at this time slot. Oh, I'm so thrilled. And after that, I'm not sure who it will be. Uh, well, Bob, you know, I've called you up a few times, and I've had a lot of fun listening to you, and i uh, really going to miss you. Well, I appreciate it. And uh, good luck in the future. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Seventeen and a half minutes after the hour of ten o'clock. Seminole, hi, you're on the air, WPLP. Bob? Yes. Hey. Uh, I just want to call and wish you good luck in the future. Say bye. You know, we're going to miss you, and I'm going to try and listen to you in the future. Well, thank you. Okay. Um, what time slot are you going to be on in your new job? I can't tell you. you can't tell me. Okay. No, I can't. Uh, first of all, it won't be for quite some time anyway. Okay. Okay? Okay, thanks a lot. Good bye -bye. bye. bye. St. Pete, you're on the air, WPLP. Hello, St. Petersburg. Yeah, St. Petersburg. Hi. Bob? Yep. I think you're one hell of a swell guy. You got a lot of good American ideas and your talks and everything. What, what do you... Did you get fired or what happened? No, I'm leaving the station. Why? Because I want to. We love you, Bobby. Well, I appreciate that, but I'm just oh. very unhappy working at nights. You're tired of working nights? That's correct. Oh, yeah? I think you got a lot of good ideas and a lot of, man, a lot of American ways. I mean, uh, say it your way, you know? Well, I thank you very much. I appreciate it, and I appreciate the call. Easter week vacation all across the nation. People head for FLA. The telephone lines to put you on the air with Bob Lasseter are currently busy. We'll let you know when the lines are open. 1020 of the time. Tampa, hi. You're on your WPLP. Hi, Bob. Hi. I was real fascinated by your admitting to uh, feeling insecure before you go on the air. Oh, very. That, that's really... Because I think most of us who... Probably be... tonight was one of... Tonight was the worst night I have ever suffered in this business. I did not feel comfortable until about 920 tonight. Well, it didn't... It certainly didn't show. I, I think there's one talk host in this area whose name and fame, I hope, will forever remain obscure, who is the most... He is so insecure that he keeps the volume lowered down on the callers. <laughs> so they never come across as strongly as he does. Now, that's insecure. Who are you talking about? It can't I'll be somebody at this tell. station. I will never... Well, it can't, it can't be someone at this station because I have no control uh, over the volume of the callers. No, the uh, producer does. Right. And, uh, well, I think he pays him off. I can say he because there are no female talk shows. Well, that's for sure. I, I don't think there ever will be. Uh, well, I don't know about that. Uh, this, uh, the, uh, I don't think this area uh, will accept them. Well, it all depends. Uh, I'm sure the area would accept some old, delightful, 90-year-old uh, Reaganite. Possibly. Possibly. I, I like it when uh, you were also talking earlier of why people talk on talk shows or why they listen to talk shows. I'll never understand it. Well, I will I think, never understand it. I think with me, it's, uh, uh, it's the ever-burning hope that one day somebody's going to call up or... Uh, and you have discussed subjects I found interesting, but it's it's that hope that you'll hear someone who doesn't think that uh, Mycenaean culture is a new AIDS test. It's that hope that not everybody, I mean, somebody out there knows something. And you, well, I, I kind of suspect for good conversation, and it's hard to find good conversation. It's hard to find people who have. More than just a, 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 a bare brush of information or experience or something interesting to talk about. Well, I have a suspicion as to why people listen to talk radio. Most people listen to talk show hosts with whom they have some type of um, affinity or agreement. Uh, I happen to be reasonably unique in this business, and probably half of my audience hates everything I say. Uh, but that's unusual in talk radio. So I, I would suspect that most people listen hoping to have their thoughts and opinions reassured by hearing other people echo them. Well, the only time I have ever uh, realized... Well, I disagreed with you on the Cheryl Brown thing, I know. Uh, and I disagree with, uh, uh, with making Rocky into a media star. Uh, I, I have never understood that. I have never 
liked it, and uh, when he gets on one of his long, noxious ejaculations of this racist vomit in extenso ad nauseum, that's the time, one of the few times that I turn you off. Well, I occasionally have, uh, I've vacillated back and forth on Rocky. I have at times, uh, well, actually for a while I banned him on the program for probably about two months. I've uh, questioned myself as to why I allow him on. I suppose the thing about it is that that scared me off was that I found more and more people calling in who agreed with him. And rather than make me think, it made me think that Rocky is imprinting himself on these other people. Oh, the, oh that I would totally disagree with. I don't think Rocky has... If Rocky has changed anyone's mind... You think they were that way to begin with, and yeah. he, he enables them to come out of the closet. It's mm -hmm. just that uh, having a good imagination, I always envision someone being annoyed to the point of perhaps provoking them into some kind of rash behavior because of his, uh, uh, his airtime. That's a possibility, but most people who sit home and call a talk radio show and spew their venom are, are not going to go out into the streets and bomb... Uh... Cowards, they? Yeah, they're cowards. They're cowards. They're, they're little Walter Mitty types uh, who sit there and become very big men or women when they pick up the telephone and, and dial a talk station. Sometimes we ought to have... Uh, uh, I know you've had polls on... Uh, but we have, we have callers who have become quite familiar and quite... They've imprinted them themselves upon our minds and it'd be kind of fun to have imitations of callers you have known loved or loathed over the years that's a fair idea i'll kick that one around <laughs> okay and i'll uh, i'll be well I'll, I'll hear you i, I hope you're going to be around for a long time i thank you much bye 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 palmetto hi you're on the air wplp hi bob hi hard to believe you're going uh tim colt has said that you'd be the one uh host on PLP would probably be accepted in communist country, but I think you're probably the one host on PLP who's demonstrated most clearly why it is the dictators always curb free speech. I uh, have listened to you since you came to PLP, and there's been many nights when, uh, especially when it meant the most, is when I was working by myself in my shop or out on location, and it'd be me and you. And uh, you kept me company. I couldn't call you. But there's been so many of your shows that I've just... Uh, have really kept me alive, you know, uh, listening in through that time. You, as a talk show host, I, I think maybe you underestimate how how much. I mean, hell, you people at PLP talk to me more than anybody anybody else. You know, probably you know, know you better than, uh, than certain members of my own family. I, and, I can understand that. I can understand that. I know that there have been a lot of talk show hosts that have, frankly, had dramatic effects on my life. And I, I don't say that uh, lightly, and I, I mean it sincerely. I'll, I'll even, I've told this one before, but I'll, I haven't mentioned it recently. Uh, the night that my divorce was final, I was living in Fort Lauderdale, and I turned on the radio, and I was uh, relatively new in the talk radio business. I was just working weekends. And I turned on one of the competing stations just in time to hear three talk show hosts gang up on me and rip me to shreds for a half an hour. It was one of the worst, blackest days of my life. Yeah. And to sit there and listen to yourself being vilified. Yeah. And I mean, you know, if you think the talk show hosts take uh, shots at each other in this market, you can't believe the kind of stuff that people will say about you in Miami. And at first, it was just devastating. But by the end of that half hour, those people had taken me out of my blue funk gave me the the courage to get up and to go on and to do better and i'd like to think uh and i've said this before literally saved my life yeah you don't know about those things but it's, and there are uh, people who never knew me yeah well you know it's, it's insidious in a way because we're always uh a little faithless unless we happen to achieve the status of a lionel or a rocky but uh i i wanted to complain too about one night when i it was me and you, and I was working by myself. I was in the middle of a black neighborhood, and I had an air compressor going, so I had to turn the volume up. I had the volume turned up, so when the compressor came on, I could still barely make out what you were saying. And here I am building this church in this black neighborhood, and, and you turned the show over to Rocky, and he spent 20 minutes interviewing the brain lady. And I was psychologically unable to turn down the radio but, uh, 
I don't know. I think maybe that thing went too far. <laughs> Any case, it was an interesting evening. Well, I thank you very much. Uh, a couple of more questions, if I could, real quick. Please. Trees pollute. Did you catch the article where the guy, I think it was from Caltech, acknowledged that trees really do pollute? Did I catch the article? No. In the Tribune, anyway. No, I did not. Uh, it was humorous, in any case. What years were you in Utica? Uh, 71 and 72. You wouldn't have happened to remember a Rabbi Waldman? No, afraid not. I was up there suffering through the winters at Colgate University, 38 miles away from you there. No, I know where it is. Awful, awful winters. Awful winters. My friend, I do have to move along, but I thank you very much. Hey, I Bob, appreciate it. South St. Petersburg, you're on the air, WPLP. Hi, Bob. Hi. Um, I'm calling not too far from Maximo Shopping Center, so I guess this can be your official remote. Okay. All right. Um, your first hour was real reminiscent of uh, a couple of my favorite shows of yours. One was that life story show you did, your life story. And uh, you went on to tell uh, all sorts of great stories about how you and your friends would go cruising around looking for uh, VFW halls that were full. Of oh, oh, yes, what well, I talked about when I was a kid, yeah. That South was Jersey. fascinating. I, I enjoyed that a lot. Maybe you could do a, another one of those kind of shows sometime pretty soon. Um, and the psychologist or whoever you had on analyzing your callers one night. Uh huh. That was kind of uh, that's what I call the Bob Lasseter greatest hits show. <laughs> I enjoyed it immensely. I, I really enjoyed that. And something you were talking to, uh, I guess it was a lady uh, before the last call, or you had mentioned, or maybe it was the last call, you had said that some of the uh, talk show hosts at competitors in Miami or Lauderdale were talking about you giving you down the road. Oh, oh you and, just wouldn't believe the things they said about me that night. Uh, the thing They're is... They're all true, too. Um, up here, though, I, I, lo I notice a lack of that. Um, now, you will, from time to time, mention Gonzalez in a favorable or less than favorable light, but... Down uh, down there, they're always talking about one another. Up here, they're not. Is that uh, why is that? <sighs> Just a different breed of talk show host, a different school of talk radio. That's the individual announcer that's uh, making that decision, or do you suppose it's uh, a management type thing? Since there are only basically two talk stations here. Well, I, I, this station, it vacillates back and forth in terms of management. There are times when they come down on you very heavy. There are other times they just look in the other direction. Yeah. And um, but it's it's primarily the hosts. Mm -hmm. um, another W O U R question. You remember? Do uh, you know Steve Huntington? No, Steve Huntington was in the uh, group of people that uh, came after me at O U R. Yeah. When I left O U R, the station was pretty much turned over to a group of people who used to work at the Syracuse University radio station. Uh huh. Bob Putman, Jeff Chart are two names that come to mind, and uh, they were after me. Um, yeah, he's, uh, he's in this area now. Yeah, so I've heard, uh, working as a sales manager, I believe. Uh, one more question. Okay. Are you, uh, are you going to take David Sanborn and the Eagles with you, or are they staying at PLP? Well, uh, take it to the limit is appropriate only at night. Yeah. And so when we play it tonight, that will probably be the last time we play it, uh, it just it just doesn't play at any other time of the day. Maybe you ought to play Already Gone tonight instead of Take It to the Limit. <laughs> well, I got what I got, and Take It to the Limit is what it is. Yeah, okay, Bob. Thanks a lot. Take care. Tampa, you're on the air at WPLP. Yeah, Bob, you know, you have a big cult following, and Wednesday night's show proved that. Don't you agree with me? I don't know. Because I'm not sure I know what you mean. All those people, they wouldn't have called if they didn't like your show. You know, they could have turned the radio off. Well, probably the humorous spirit of it. There are a number of people that listen to this program who are just plain masochists. They despise me, despise everything about the program, but they, they can't help but listen to it. And I hope you play some of your classic calls tonight, because I'd really love to hear some of them. I'd love to hear them, too. Unfortunately, I, I no longer have them. Oh, really? If I did, I would have played them. Uh-huh. And another thing, Cheryl Brown does look at her co-anchor funny. I have to admit I think so. I have to admit it. There's something going on. No, I don't think there's anything going on outside of a consultant that has uh, told them that's what they should do. I don't and know. It's all the rage in television today that there be this, this slight hint of uh, maybe something going on between the two anchors. It's all over the country. It's not just Channel 10. I, it's done at the other stations here as well. I know. She's a little ridiculous, but that's the way it is. She's doing what she's told to do. Okay. Take care. Bye. St. Pete, you're on here at WPLP. Bob. Yes. Uh, I should call you Mr. Laster. I'm a short-time listener and a first-time caller. I would like to say that, that 
me listening to you. I didn't particularly like some of your comments, but now I've grown to respect you as a uh, mortal human being with some flaws. Uh, lots of them. <laughs> some warts, too. We have a, we, we humans have lots of flaws. Um, I do want to say wherever you're going, I wish I knew where you were going and when you're going to be on the air. Uh, my grandmother, who also turned me on to PLP... Just... Well, 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 now, wait a second. I, you know, I had promised the people here that I would not use the facilities of this radio station to promote where I was going, but, no, no, you know, it's been in the paper today. It has been a topic of conversation on the other station, and it's been a topic of conversation on this station, I'm going to WFLA. Oh, are you? Yes. Oh, I see. With Jack Ellery. Maybe. Oh, I see. Well, I'm not, I don't want to get you upset in any reason. But I do want to wish you luck. I uh, hope you do uh, f have phenomenal success. And I just wish that you, I had listened to you a lot longer so we, I could know you better than what, I, than what I do now. I'll be around. Oh, well. I, but I don't know if I'll be able to listen to you. I'm, I drive a truck all day, and I would understand you're going from 3 to 7. And I'm on the road usually at those hours. You misunderstand. Oh, did I? Yes. Uh, what was my misunderstanding? 3 to 7. Three to seven in the morning. No, it's not three to seven. Period. I see. Okay. I can't. I cannot say what time slot it is, but it is not three to seven. Okay. Well. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Oh, well, it's okay. But I just hope you have great success in whatever your ventures are. Thank you very much. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. The telephone lines to put you on the air with Bob Lasseter are currently busy. We'll let you know when the lines are open. Uh, I wake up every morning. Wishing that they had killed me. And Jim does too. the melodic tones of Sasha Stepankevich and the boys for one last time. Clearwater, hi, you're on the air WPLP. Good evening, Bob. Good evening. I have a couple of questions I'd like to ask you about talk radio in general and then finish up with a comment. If okay, I'll do my best. All right. Uh, first of all, you've mentioned uh, that you sweat before you go on the shows uh, every night. Could you speak up a little bit? Uh, we're having just a wee bit of trouble hearing you. Sure, I just said I, I understand that you sweat a little bit before you go on the shows every night. Lots of it. Okay, well, what I wanted to ask you... Tonight was the worst, by the way. I mean, literally, this was the worst show I have had to do in terms of being nervous. It wasn't until about 20 after 9 that I got into it tonight. Well, like the lady said before, you really didn't show it. That didn't come through on the radio. It just, uh, as usual... I can usual, sure hear the tremble like, in my voice. Well, it, it felt like another chat with a friend, you know, like it usually does. Um, the question I wanted to ask you is... Uh, does the, do you ever have any trouble? It seems that you've done, you said, 600 and some talk shows. Mm -hmm. Do you ever wonder, what on earth am I going to talk about ah, tomorrow? Ah, ah, are you kidding? <laughs> uh, there, there have been nights when I have sat here with the news playing at 8 o'clock saying, oh, my God, what are we going to do tonight? It would yes, seem, I do. It would seem like the radio equivalent of a writer's block. I, I would panic in that situation. I do. <laughs> okay, question number two. You're uh, well familiar with uh, the nationally syndicated talk shows like Larry King or Ed mm -hmm. Bush or something like that. Right. I have been, I have been kind of introduced to talk radio through WPLP when I moved here about a year and a half ago, and I've since, ever, I've since then, every now and then I will listen to Larry King, and the one biggest difference that I have noticed is that on your station and, and smaller radio stations, you can have a conversation with a host, and that absolutely isn't done on the Larry King show. If you mm -hmm. dare to make a comment, you're asked to, uh, you know, what's the question? Right. And then as soon as you ask it, you're gone. There's no conversation. There's no chance for rebuttal. It's uh, you know, Is that done simply because there's such a vast number of callers and they try and accommodate most of them? No, it's simply because there's such a vast number of callers and they don't have to put up with them. <laughs> I wondered if that was, you know, if that might be the case. Uh, I would much rather have a uh, call next one, but I don't have the luxury of uh, an audience of three million people and fourteen incoming lines. You, you'd rather do the shorter calls too? Oh yes. Hmm. I, you see that way you train your audience. The people that call the King Show know that they don't have much time, and they've got to get to the point. They've got to get to it quick. 
or they know they're gone. Well, he is so popular, he has very good guests sometimes, and uh, it seems a shame to uh, you know, put people on there who get to ask one question and they're gone and they have to listen to the answer on the radio. So it seems like there could be much better conversation uh, with some of these guests that he has, but they're never really given the opportunity to do so. And I just that's one of the things that I've enjoyed about your show, and, and for that matter, most local talk radio is that you know, of course, certain ta- certain times people get out of hand and they get long-winded and go on and on. But you know, for the most part, I enjoy the two-way conversation where the host actually talks back. <laughs> well, in theory, we're supposed to have a call on for no more than three minutes. Um, I do have a little clock in front of me. I'm one of the very few people at the station that uses it, uh, and I do. You know, for example, you have now been on for three minutes and twenty-five seconds. I Mark. have. Yes. Good Lord. Uh, what I basically do, even though I look at the clock, as soon as I start getting bored with a call, be it 40 seconds or 40 minutes, that's when the call goes. I see. All right. Well, my uh, closing comment here is, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, I started listening to you shortly after I moved here about a year and a half ago. And, uh, you know, it's you have impressed me as somebody who really, you're, you're kind of a friend to me. And uh, you have been ever since. And... Uh, you know, I wish you luck where you're going. And in fact, you've been such a good friend that you've pulled me away from things I really like to used to do. And uh, you know, that's quite a compliment, and I appreciate it. Well, I, you know, it's uh, it's not goodbye for long. It's just uh, you know, so long for now. We'll talk again. Okay. Bye bye. Good night, Tampa. You're on the air at WPLP. Oh, uh, good evening, Mad Dog. Uh, good evening. Just wanted to make sure you knew there were two Mad Dog freaks here, and uh, we're going to try to follow you on the dial. But uh, like that last caller said about uh, a la Larry King, uh, you know, both of us work all day long and come home at night and relax to the radio talk show. Maybe you like Larry King, you can repeat yours, not three in the morning, but maybe uh, <laughs> every night at this channel. <laughs> maybe maybe we'll keep Mike employed anyhow before the radio goes too well, far. I don't know. I don't know that there have been very many of these that have been worth repeating. Well, you mentioned a few tonight, though. <laughs> So, uh, you know, we, we've enjoyed them. Yeah, but that's over. You know, I've done over 500 shows at the station, and I think we mentioned maybe uh, at best a dozen of them. Yeah. Well, how about at least once a week, then they'll keep WPLP busy. Whatever. The best of Bob Laster. Well, Mad Dog, keep it up, and we enjoyed it. Thank you much. Okay. Bye-bye. St. Pete, you're on the air at WPLP. Oh, uh, hi, Bob. Hi. Uh, you were speaking about being nervous earlier yourself. This is the first time calling for me, so I'm a little bit nervous myself. Oh, I'm more than understand. I just wanted to convey what one of your former callers said there, and you've been a buddy of mine for some a number of months, and I don't have the option to call often because I work too. But I want to tell you we appreciate it, and we're definitely going to be looking for you somewhere else, wherever that may be. Well, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. St. Peter on the air, WPLP. Oh, yes, sir, Miss Lester? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, you know, try to make it as quick as possible. I had it all down, but now I got all nervous again because the phone came on. Take your time. Okay, thanks. Um, some months back, you talked about uh, your life ch- your life from child to present almost, okay? Mm-hmm. A couple months ago, I guess. Now, right before that, uh, you were talking, and um, I don't know, some guy said something. My mother asked you not to say this, and you said, tell your mother to go to hell. Mm-hmm. And I'm the fool that calls you up. Right after that call, I got on. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, wait, I forgot one thing. I knew I'd forget something. But when you're talking about your life, you were talking about how nice it is to ask somebody forgiveness and they forgive you. And I've been wanting to do this for so long, but it's one of those things that I just say, well, I don't know whether I should or not. He might just hang up on me or laugh at me or something. Maybe now it wasn't the right time, but now I had to say it now. I'm out on a pay phone now because we had to move. We don't have a phone yet. But I was really a fool for calling you up and saying like this. Well, you weren't. You were offended. I was offended, but, you know, after I heard you talk, I realized, man, I don't even know you. I know nothing about you. So you make one little statement to somebody, and I was like, man, this guy thinks he knows everything, you know? Well, I'll make a deal with you. I'll forgive you if you forgive me for offending you. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, by my call, you're already forgiven, and I thank you. Thank you. You're a nice man, and I wish the best for you and Mary. I really do. Thank you. Take care. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. St. Pete, you're on the air at WPLP. Richard Shanks and uh, Tim Coles were the stars, and Ken Charles was the producer at a remote at Maxima about three, three and a half years ago. Okay. And I just wanted to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think what he probably meant uh, was the, um, oh, mercy, what is it called? It is also on US-19, but it's in North St. Petersburg. It's uh, a discount mall that we did. 
one of our birthday parties out in December two and a half years ago. What? That's probably what he meant. Oh, I just want, I just felt sad that uh, I heard it on the radio in the car when I was coming home, and I didn't get home till now, and I thought, well, I better make the man feel better anyhow, you know. Well, I'm glad you cleared it up. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Marco, you're on the air at WPLV. Bob, I just wanted to mention that everyone that listens is not insecure, and we love you. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Tampa, you're on the air at WPLV. Uh, Bob. Yes, sir? Uh, just, I wanted to get one thing straight. If you're going to stay in the Tampa Bay area and you go very far and we don't hear from you for a while, we're going to worry about your drowning. <laughs> worry about my driving? Drowning. Oh, drowning, I see. Uh, I mean... You, that's just about how far you can go in Tampa Bay. But anyway, it's good to know that we're going to be able to find you or your body, one or the other. One or the other, for sure. <laughs> Take care. Okay, bye-bye. Tampa, you're on the air at WPLP. A very sad day, Bob. Get off the speakerphone, Lionel. Jeez. It's not a speakerphone. Well, what is it? All of this drivel, we're going to miss you... You've been so special. Where are all those crackpots that you've offended for the past couple of years? The old people who went into an anal clutch based upon what you told them. Where are they tonight? Well, I, uh, it's my understanding they're all down at the old Coliseum in St. Petersburg celebrating. Looking for a little fun. Bob, you're a traitor. What's going to happen to that... Whoa, whoa, what do you mean I'm a traitor? You but, talk on both stations. Poor, I'm not being paid by them. Uh, not yet, that is. What's going to happen to that poor, run-down little hovel? WPLP. With a little tin can transmitter. Mike Serio, who's going to go back and be a pearl diver from humor again. All these people... Those people who are sitting right now in the control room eating cold chicken and crying because they realize that they're going to have to go back and do a, a, own another chain of tall and big men shops in Japan. Bob? Yes? I don't want to say that I'm going to miss you. Cut that out, Bob. All right. This is a very serious moment here. Oh. I'm missing crime story to talk to you. You're missing crime story? Oh, you poor baby. And I would like a little reverence, please. A little? That's exactly what you'll get here, Lionel. Very little reverence. Bob, we've been through a lot. We have? We went through the Yoki call. Radio history. When we ran him out of town. <laughs> Remember that, Bob? Oh, I'll never forget it. <laughs> Doing Joe Pippin jokes. I mean, it was tremendous. <laughs> Talking about the lousy Saturday lineup, Mr. Plant Honey, and all of that stuff. But you know, it worked. Because they listened to you, Bob. Yoki's through. Now you've got the Susquehanna Hat Company that's come in here, and what's the first thing they do? They run you out. That's what's so sad about this. They whole thing. didn't run, as a matter, they're not even in here yet. They're not in here yet? No, they what, didn't run out. Did they come in at midnight and clean up? Oh, no, I forgot that cereal's job. Bob, with all candor, with all seriousness, you have made radio history in I this have. market. Don't you realize what you've done? You have caused more old people to be apoplectic than a bad run of preparation H. Well, now I beg your pardon. i got quite a few young people in that same condition, too. Oh, no, I've heard of the... Well, all those, you know... Let's face it, your average caller has the IQ of a speed bump and has a hard time making a fist without reading the instructions. Come on, I, 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 I disagree. What about all those born-again Boy Scouts that I've, I've upset? The born-again Christians, people that you've derided, you've taken their faith, and you've wiped parts of your body with it. It's disgusting, and I love it. Bob, I wish you only mediocrity, because if you ever really make it big, if you ever truly make the big bucks, we're talking 20, 25 grand, then you're not going to be the same. Because you know what makes you so special, Bob? You're hungry. And for you to be hungry is like having a giraffe with a sore throat. But, Bob, I'm very sad tonight. 
And I understand you are going to do WTMP, is that correct? Oh, uh, yes, WTMP, yes. I'm doing overnight for TMP. When is the Mamba station going to take effect? Uh, that, unfortunately, they lost the construction permit on, and the Mamba station is just out. Bob, since we've talked so much before, and I call you Perro Loco for all you Spanish people because you are a truly a mad dog, can you tell, do you remember some of the lighthearted moments that we've gone through? Remember when you came back from your from your honeymoon, and I questioned you about the sexual goings on between you and your wife. Remember that that was truly radio history. Well, if you enjoyed it, Lionel, I loved that's it. what I'm here for. I loved it more. I still can't walk straight. Seriously, I'll bet it's like a half a husky. Oh, doesn't take much to get you excited, does it, Lionel? Bob. Well, Dean really had your number. Who has? Levine. You keep bringing up that husband. Levine, you know, really had you under control. I mean, even he had you trained. How was that? What the? I mean, I, I would rem I remember every call would always end the same. Levine would say, "Say goodbye, Lionel," you're and you'd sit there and say, "Goodbye, Lionel," you're and he'd hang up on you. You're not going to do that. You know why I did that to Levine? Do you know why? Why? Because the man was a glue addict, and it made me sad. A the man with tough addict. liquid paper. I've seen it. I've been to FLA before. I know what's going on. Bob, I'm so sad tonight. What's going to happen to PLP? Who is going to kick Tim Coles around anymore? Wait a second. Don't be sad for me. I got, I got a parking space in the lot directly across the street. From what? I had to give up $38,000 a year to do it. What parking space? Well, that was that was the main point of of the negotiation. The parking lot right across the street. I mean, most you know most of the other parking spaces they provide are you know up in loots. Now let's face it. Another interesting thing I heard today was Ted Webb was on the air, and he said that you were going to come in and he was going to go on quote vacation. Yes, that's news to me. I heard that driving and in tonight. No one's to... mentioned that to me. This is the squeeze play, Bob. You're going to go in. And you're going to rape that station like you did this one. You took all of the callers and you brought them to your own show. And you left poor people like Jack Wheeler, radio's answer to Al Martino. You I mean, gotta... what's going to happen to these people from now on? Lionel, I, I just don't know, but but my friend, I, I must I must say goodnight. Bob, let's don't say au revoir. Let's say hors d'oeuvre. Okay. Godspeed, my friend, and see you at church. Oh, no. Or some kind of church. Say good night, Lionel. Only for you will I do this. Good night, Lionel. Oh, my. One other thing I wanted to mention before we wrapped it up this evening. The people. There are an awful lot of people at this radio station. There are a lot of people who used to be at this radio station whose names never get mentioned or rarely get mentioned. And I just wanted to take a, a brief moment or two to go through a list. Because the people who are here are very important. Let me start out with Joyce. Joyce is someone who has worked here for about the last six months. I spent 18 months twisting arms to get her to come up here. You know, damn it, I still haven't had a chance to work with her. There's Nancy, who always sits by the door and listens in. There's Manachair, a man who I admire more than I can ever put into words. And there's Mike G and Dave and Stan and Scott and Stacy and Tommy. There's Gordon, a young man I believe in. There's Tracy and Mike Hennessy and Paul and Kathy and John and, and Tim. They're all the people in sales. Who I still don't most, still don't really know their names. Maybe someday. And then there are the people who don't even work here anymore. People I'd like to say thanks to, like Mati and Marty and Whitney and Rick. And, of course, there's Don and there's Mark. And there are the supporting players. Rocky, Southside Johnny, the Petitioner, the Brandon Brain Lady, and, of course, Lionel. Plus all of the nameless callers who carried the ball for the last 24 months on those nights when I couldn't. I thank you one and all. I also thank the 3,700 people who supported the minimum wage campaign and the other thousands who took time and effort to send in petitions for the So Far campaign. It's been fun, but we'll talk again. Until then, behave yourselves.